Good morning, Facebook. Jesse here covering for the morning meditation. Today, we're going to look at the book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Just two verses we're going to cover. Um, last video, we covered uh, verses 12 through 14. Um, and today, we're going to cover 15 through 17. If you have a Bible, you can open up. If you don't have a Bible, um, we usually have Brandy, who joins online, and we'll put the verses in the chat so you can follow along in that manner. Uh, but either way, um, you're going to hear the Word of God today. So um, the title of this section, if you guys have a Bible, I'll just show you mine. I also really believe, and this is something the Lord's been showing me recently, is that we need to read the Bible uh, with expectation. Okay, we need to read the Bible with expectation. One of the ways that you show God and show yourself that you expect him to speak is that you take notes. Taking notes um, is you putting yourself in a position that you're saying, I believe that God's going to say something to me that's worth writing down. I believe that God's going to speak something that's worth taking note of. You look in the book of Habakkuk, when God spoke to Habakkuk, God told him to write down the vision and make it plain, to write it clearly so that he can follow through with it. And imagine if Habakkuk said, oh, sorry, God, I don't have a pen on hand. I don't, you know, I don't have anything to write with. You know, he wouldn't have been able to follow the Lord's instruction if he didn't write it down. Think about Moses. When God gave him those Ten Commandments, Moses had to write that down. And um, I think it's important. Something actually I don't do enough is write down um, when I'm learning. But I challenge you, I encourage you, um, and I'm going to accept the challenge as well um, for the next uh, few days when I listen to uh, the Word of God, when I hear the Word of God, I encourage you to take a pen, take a pencil, write things down. Get a Bible, get a paper and pencil, get your coffee, um, you know, whatever you can do to write things down, um, it's very important. If you don't have a pencil or pen, maybe you could write things down in the comment section. Even that... When you write in the comments, it's helping you remind yourself of truth, and it's also encouraging others. So the reason I said that is as I show you my Bible, uh, some of you guys uh, have asked, how do I remember the Bible? Uh, how do I remember the scriptures? And one of the keys that has helped me in my life to remember the Word of God is uh, I mark it up. I write in it. Um, so if you don't want to mark up your Bible, get a pencil and paper and write down um, when something sticks out to you. Um, I was just doing it the other day in my notes app. I was reading Psalm uh, 114, and I have a bunch of notes on it, and I can always look back at that. So I encourage you guys to get a pencil and paper, a little side comment there. I wasn't expecting to say that, but, you know, it's just important to do. So we're going to be in First John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. And if you have a Bible, uh, your section probably says like this. It says, Do not love the world. That's the title that's the topic. That's the um, now that title is not in there um, when the Bible was written. There's actually no verses when the Bible was written, no chapters. It was all just one letter, one long uh, scribe. But uh, people have made verses. People have made um, topics for our understanding. I think this is a great title. Do not love the world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. And then we're going to get right into the study time. So uh, why don't you pray with me? So, Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. Father, I thank you that you call us not to love the things of this world. Father, I pray that we would learn to detach from what is temporary and focus on what is eternal. I pray that we would have the love of the Father emanating from our lives, um, exuding forth from our character, our speech, our actions. I pray that, God, you would help us to love you more than anything else, because this is your greatest commandment, to love you, Lord. And these worldly distractions are, are very, very real. They're very, very um, right in front of us, especially in America. Uh, we see the news, we see the social media, we see the magazines, the people, the places, um, all these things that people are running to. Um, Lord, it's all one big smoke screen. 
to distract us from reality because reality is you, Lord. So I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let's read the passage. Do not love the world, verse 15. We're in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Amen. The first command in this passage is to not love the world. Do not love it. Don't love it. It's a command to not do something. But it doesn't just stop there because God's going to tell us, instead of just not loving the world, I want you to replace that love with the love of the Father. Uh, there's a book that's really good called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. Uh, you can look that up. It's actually kind of an older book. Uh, the language might be a little bit more old school English, but The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And in that book, I remember reading it, it talks about how the Lord doesn't want to um, diminish or kill our cravings, our passions, our desires. He's given us passions. But what he wants to do is have the power of all that desire go to something that's worth desiring. Go to something that's good. Go to something that's awesome and wonderful and worth our attention and affection. And the thing that's worth the most of our attention and if all of our attention and affection. Sorry, I have something in my eye. There we go. Is the Lord and the things of, the, of God, the things of the Holy Spirit. Because those desires are, God's given us desire and he doesn't just want to squash that out like a pea and just squash it out and just crush it. No, he wants us to have this desire transferred onto something that can actually satisfy the soul. It's like C.S. Lewis said very similarly. He said, we're far too easily pleased. He said, our desires are not too strong, but they're too weak. He says, we're content like children playing with mud pies in a slum when there's a vacation at the beach available before us. So C.S. Lewis is saying, you know what? The problem is not that we have too big of a desire. The problem is our desire is too little. We're settling for the things of this world, this, this sub joy, this small thing that gives us some kind of happiness, which is like a mud pie in the slum, which is fun for a little bit. But you know what? We have this vacation at the shore. It's 10 million times better than making a mud pie in the slum. But sin and the world and the flesh, it's like, why would you go make a mud pie in the slum when you can go to the vacation at the beach? The vacation at the beach is Jesus is the things of the Holy Spirit, is the things of God. It's like so much better. I always give the analogy, I say it like this, you know, you might like hot dogs. And if you eat a hot dog, you might enjoy that hot dog. You might think this hot dog is the best thing ever. Where I actually had hot dogs yesterday and, and I made an a egg omelet with eggs, hot dogs and cheese. It was so good. Shout out to Steph Boyer making some fresh eggs. I ate eight of them. It was crazy. And hot dogs are pretty good, right? But last night, we went to Ginza uh, as a family. We went out to eat. And my sister got filet mignon, and she shared some with me. And I remember having that filet mignon. That was so good. And I remember saying to myself, or, or imagine, you know, you eat that filet mignon. I'm like, this is so good. Now, you know what? Now that I had a filet mignon, the hot dog is no longer... And I've had filet mignon before. It wasn't my first time. But the hot dog, I thought, you know, you think it's the best food ever. You think it's like so good. This hot dog's incredible. Then you have a filet mignon steak, the primest cut of the pig, not the pig, the primest cut of the cow, 
the prime cut of the cow and that thing is so it hits it smacks it's good you eat that thing you're like you know what this hot dog is no longer where it's at this filet mignon is where it's at because you had something better so it shows you the lack of goodness of the hot dog you know what i'm talking about so okay when you have something so good, it makes something that you thought was good seem not as good. I hope I'm making sense. I think I am. It's the contrast. Yes, she and thank you for putting it. It's the contrast of the greater shows you how weak the lesser is. And so for some of us, we think the world is so great. We think going to the casino is so great. We think being stuck in lustful thoughts in our looking at things we know we're not supposed to, we think that feeling is so great. We think that cursing feels so fun. We think that, you know, just letting our emotions rule our life and lashing out in anger feels so good and venting and yelling and screaming. We think that holding that grudge, it just feels so great. We think that the new expensive toy or car or a bigger house whiter teeth and shinier shoes is the best thing ever we love the world but then you come to christ you come face to face with the cross the blood the power of the love of god and you say you know what all this stuff that i thought was so great isn't the best there's something greater this joy i have in christ is like that filet mignon it's so great I'm not going to go back to the hot dog. This, this joy I have in Christ is like the vacation at the beach. I'm not going to go back to the mud pies and the slums. This joy I have in the Lord is so, this freedom I have in Christ, this peace that surpasses knowledge, this love that, that I have never felt before, this unconditional love that I don't deserve is so good. Why am I going to this world to satisfy my soul? It's the contrast. And it's true. You know, the thing in your life that's going to free you from sin, that's going to deliver you from sin, the thing in your life that's going to, you know, allow you to detach from the world is not some monk-like willpower. It's not some aesthetic lifestyle to deny pleasure. It's not to put tape over your mouth so you don't curse. It's not to put a blindfold over your eyes so that you don't lust. It's not to put plugs in your ears so you don't hear what people have to say. It's not that you shut yourself out of the world. The power to overcome these temptations of the world is to fill your desire with the Word of God. To fill your desire with Jesus, with His presence with his word. Amen. So it says in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world, the toys, the trinkets, the money, the, you know, there's so many verses about the warnings to those who are rich because those who are rich have very strong temptations to hold on to these things in this world. Now, money is not a bad thing. Praise the Lord for money. If you didn't have money, we'd all be starving. We wouldn't be able to eat. We'd all be homeless, right? Money is not a bad thing. We'd all, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do much without money, right? So money's not a bad thing. We wouldn't be able to purchase a Bible. We wouldn't be able to get a car to go to church, right? Money is not a sinful thing. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. The love of of craving of desire, the covetousness that comes through greed is a great temptation. So how do we overcome greed? We overcome that with generosity. We overcome that with thankfulness. And we look at money different. When we come to the gospel, when we come to Christ, we look at money no longer as a way to just fuel our pleasure. We look at money as a way to be blessed, to be a blessing to others. So the things in this world, you know, they don't satisfy. I remember 
Um, you know, I just got a new truck recently. I mean, not super recently, but probably like five months ago, four months ago, maybe. Um, and I remember uh, right, right after I got it, I was just like, wow, this is probably the nicest thing I've ever owned in my entire life. And it's a huge blessing from God. Um, and, um, but you know, now that I have a nice truck, I'm like super cautious with it, right? I, won't, I don't want to park it in the parking lot next to the other cars. I don't want it to get hit. And I remember uh, I was coming out of TD Bank and uh, I was putting on my worship music and I was backing out of the uh, parking lot and I smashed, not very hard, but I, I smashed into another car. And um, this is a few months ago and uh, the light broke on it. There's a little dent and um, on the back, the other car wasn't damaged at all, just my car. And I just remember being like, oh no. And I just felt like heavy in my heart about it, you know? It was really the smallest thing. Honestly, you wouldn't even notice it if you walked by it. But um, I took it to the uh, repair shop and he was like, yeah, it's going to be like $1,000 to fix, like over $1,000. I'm just like, what in the world? You know? But I remember like after having that like mini, mini, mini accident, um, the Lord was showing me, you know, don't be attached to this piece of metal. Don't be attached to this truck. It's just a truck. Yeah, you have like a tiny little damage thing on it. But because I had something nice, that was the first time I actually felt like a little bit, because I've been in a little bit of accidents, very few accidents. I'm, not, I'm a good driver. I got a good record. I think only one of them was my fault in an accident. Um, but that accident, that was my fault. Um, never uh had any damage to either of us it was like a little little tap so i've been hit before it's been other people's faults except for that td bank one i just told you about um but the point is and every time i've had you know a car interaction i didn't really care too much about the car you know what i mean it's just like i had like a cheap car but now that i had a nice car i got a little bit more attached right and the bible says no no, no don't let yourself get attached to this world don't let yourself get attached to a piece of metal moth and rust will destroy it don't let yourself get attached to that, you know, whatever that thing is. That's why the Bible says, thou shalt not covet, right? Praise the Lord. And, and there's nothing wrong with having nice things. If you are watching this video, uh, don't feel bad if you have nice things. <coughs> but beware of the love of money. Beware of the distractions of this world. Beware the temptations of greed. It says, do not love the world. Let's define the world because we talk about the world and it almost seems like confusing. It says, don't love the world. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him has eternal life. So it's telling us, the Bible's telling us not to love the world, but it says that God so loved the world. What, what's, what's going on here? Is this a contradiction? Well, it's not. What happens is uh, uh, the Bible speaks of the world in three different ways. I don't know if you knew that. The Bible speaks of the world in three different ways. Let's go to the book of John. I'll explain this real briefly. So in the book of John chapter 1, there's a verse that will show you three different ways the world is used. And Brandon, if you could put this verse in the chat, um, this would be great. It's uh, John chapter 1 verse 10 says he was in the world speaking of christ he was in the world and the world was made through him yet the world did not know him okay he was in the world and the world was made through him yet the world did not know him the bible speaks of the world in three different ways so it says he was in the world and brandy if you could put this verse in the chat is john 1 10 or someone else uh can do that john 1 10 uses the word world three times in one verse. And in this one verse, you see three different ways this word world is being used. It says that he was in the world. The first way the world is used is saying he was in the, um, the earth, right? Wait, give me one second. Let me make sure I'm saying this right. He was in the world. Uh, 
Yeah, so it says he was in the world and the world was made through him. So the first way that world is being used is that um, he was in, in the earth. Okay, the world represents the earth, right? He was on the earth, the world. And then it says, and the world was made through him. The world represents the universe. So, and then it says, yet the world did not know him. So the world, meaning the world did not know him, represents uh, the worldly people, the worldly system, um, the, the non-believers. So when, the wor- when God speaks of the world, he speaks of, number one, the people in the world, okay? Like when it says God so loved the world, um, he's speaking of the people, every, all the people in the world. When the Bible speaks about the world, it's speaking of the created universe, the created universe. And then number three, the world represents the world system, a.k.a. the non-believing world. So the people in the universe, write this down, um, the people in the universe, the universe itself, and then the world system slash the non-believing world. Okay, so... In Hebrews, sorry, we're in First John. First John chapter 2. People in the world, the created universe, and the fallen world system. Yes, Sheehan, thank you for putting that in the chat. So when the Bible says do not love the world, it's obviously not referring to um, number one. It's not referring to the people in the world because we're supposed to love everyone, right? We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. So God is not telling us not to love people. He's telling us not to love, number three, the fallen world system. The fallen world system. Did you know that the world is governed by Satan? The world is governed by Satan. The Bible calls Satan the God of this world. The ruler of this world. Um... There's many names for Satan, but he's called the God of this world because he's ruling and he's controlling the world system in many ways. So the world, um, the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. uh, That's in Romans chapter 12. So it says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world system, uh, don't let the philosophy of this world don't let the mindsets of this world don't let the antichrist and we're going to learn about antichrist in the next video the antichrist system um all these things that are counter to god so worldly things are things that are opposite of god um and it's also going to define worldly things as sinful things don't love the world don't love the world system don't love don't do what the crowd's doing. This is what the Bible's saying. Don't follow the herd. Follow the word. Don't follow the crowd. Follow the king. Don't follow the media. Follow... I was trying to come up with an M, but I couldn't. <laughs> follow the mediator. Amen. The mediator. Follow God. Do not love the world. Don't love it. Don't hold on to it. Don't be so excited about it. Or the things in the world. Uh, There's a song that says, uh, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My home's beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't find myself in this world anymore. Right? That song, um, it's called This World is Not My Home. Listen to that song. If you get a chance, someone put that in the chat. This world is not my home. And this song talks about how this world is not our home. We're strangers, we're aliens. And in the song, it says, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My home is in the heavens beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't find myself in this world anymore. And I love that song because it's talking about this world. It's just not it, right? But the Bible calls this world a tent that we groan in. A tent is uncomfortable, right? But it says that heaven is that building we have from God. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's 
where there's no more brokenness because the brokenness has come through sin. So don't love the world or the things in this world. Don't be materialistic. Jesus was not materialistic. He was generous. Uh, Jesus didn't love this world system. Jesus, in fact, was homeless. He was traveling around. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Uh, Jesus focused on the kingdom of God, not building the kingdom of this earth. Right? And that's how we are to be. We're not supposed to be getting too comfortable here. Uh, verse 15 says, If anyone loves the world, so it's talking about the word love here a lot. If anyone loves the world, it's, it's about what you love. He's coming at our affections. He's coming at the deeper motives of our heart. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Bible shoots it straight. The Bible makes it clear that if you love the world, if this world is your home, <clears throat> if this world is what you love, <coughs> you're not saved. You're really not saved. That doesn't mean you don't enjoy good gifts from God. But if this world system is all you think about, if you never think about eternal things, if you don't care about the word of God, if this world has a greater desire in your heart than God, you're not saved. Clear as day. Clear as day. No question about it. It says this, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love the world, then God's love is not in you. Because if God's love is in you, you're not going to love the world. It's plain and clear. So think about that. Verse 15, 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Okay, so now he's going to talk about what's in the world. So the world system contains three desires. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. So these three temptations actually are shown in the book of Genesis. Uh, so you look in the book of Genesis, you look at the story of Adam and Eve, and you see these three desires were what Satan appealed to, to tempt Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve. So look at Genesis. Um, we're going to look at chapter 3. Okay. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say to you, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a, a light to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So look in this passage, you will see the three temptations of the desires of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, and the pride of life are what Eve fell into. Look at verse 6, Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the first thing that tempted Eve was she saw showing you my big eyes right now. Her eyes were like saucers when she saw this delectable fruit. She couldn't help look away. After Satan chirped in her ear, she saw, man, this tree looks good. She first desired it with her eyes. Right? Sin starts with the eyes. We look at something. Much of the sin of lust, especially sexual sin, comes from the eyes. We look at something. And we want it, right? The tree, she saw that the tree was good for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one 
wise. So this is the uh, pride of life. Okay, this is the pride of life. She said right here, I want to be wise. Uh, that's the pride of life. I want to be I want to I want to be wise because Satan said if you eat it you won't die. So she said, "You know what? I'm going to eat this because of my pride. I'm going to be wise. It's going to make me wiser than God. It's going to make me um you know, that's how Satan fell too. Right? Satan said, "Oh yeah, I'm going to be wiser than God. I'm going to make myself like God. Um I'm going to disobey his instructions because of my pride." I'm going to hold on to my life because I'm not going to die. What God said is not really true. And so that pride of life, desire to make one wise. And then it says she took of the fruit and she ate. Right? She took of the fruit and she ate. That's the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. To eat it, to satisfy that craving, that hunger craving, that flesh. To satisfy the the feeling of eating that food that fleshly eating of that sinful forbidden fruit so the desire of the eye she saw it the desire of the pride of life she wanted to be wise and then the desire of the flesh of eating it uh, and pleasing her flesh pleasing her appetite uh, think about jacob and esau right he um he saw the stew and he, when he saw that stew um, you know, he said, you know what? Um, I'm going to sell my birthright because this stew looks so good. And then he was so hungry. That was his flesh. He said, you know, I'm so hungry. I want to just feed my flesh. He eats that stew. And then he had the pride of life. He didn't care about his birthright. His pride took over. His selfishness took over. And he ended up selling his birthright for a single pot of stew. Amen. So this pattern of temptation uh, is very powerful. And it actually gives us a key into how the enemy works. You can also look at Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was tempted by Satan himself. And he tempted Jesus with the lust of the flesh when uh, Satan said, you know, turn these stones into bread. I want you to, um, to turn these stones into bread and please your flesh and eat, eat and satisfy your craving, your hunger. And then he said, I want you to uh, jump off this cliff. That's the pride of life, and the angels will, will protect you. That's the pride of life, because he was saying, you know what? You, you don't have to fear death. You have the angels. You, don't, you, can, you can take pride. You can, you can um, show off, right? That was the pride of life. And then the desires of the eyes, where um, Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of this world, and Jesus got to see the power that he could have had with his own eyes. And... That was the lust of the eyes. So Jesus overcame the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life in the way that Satan fell in eating the tree. Jesus overcame Satan's temptation, and Jesus died on the tree to give us the power to overcome temptation, to give us forgiveness of our sins. Amen. So the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. These temptations, they're not from the Father. God is not the one tempting you. God is not the one, uh, the Bible says, let no one when he's tempted say, I'm being tempted by God. For God himself cannot tempt one with evil. Verse 17 says, and the world is passing away along with its desires. This universe is actually passing away. This world system is passing away. Um, all this stuff, this this. This little thing is passing away. This piece of metal, right? This thing is going to rust, right? I don't even know what it is, but... Oh, gosh, something came out of it. That was weird. Okay, anyway. All these things that we see <laughs> are going to pass away. My iPhone is going to pass away. One thing that will not pass away is the words written in this book. So, you know, the Bible says that we are called to not focus on things that pass away. Uh, in Matthew 6, it says... Lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where they will never be destroyed. Don't lay up treasures on earth where they'll be eaten up by moth and rust. So the world is passing away along with its desires. Okay? But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever follows the word of God, who does the will of God, who serves the king of kings, who loves everyone in the world, who has love, 
who does the things of the Lord. That person will abide forever. That person will have an everlasting kingdom awaiting them and everlasting rewards set before them because they've done the will of God. So the world, what the world tries to do is stop you from doing the will of God. But the will of God, doing that is something that's eternal. So put your passion in to Christ. And you know what? You might be saying, I don't have the passion for Christ. I don't feel desire for him. What do I do? Well, here's what you can do. You ask God to fill your desire. You ask God to give you and grant you desire for him. God loves to hear that prayer. He will answer that prayer. There's many prayers I don't can't guarantee that he'll answer. But I guarantee if you pray, I guarantee it. Because God says if you ask anything according to his will, he'll answer you. If you ask God to give you more desire for him and less desire for the world, he will answer that prayer. Get alone, shut the door, and pray to your father in secret and ask him for more desire for the things of God, and he will do it. It's not just enough to ask, though. You have to seek the things of God. Ask, and you'll receive. Seek, and you will find. Seek the things of God. Seek to be in church. Seek to be in his word. Seek to be in fellowship. Seek to be in prayer. Seek things of God. Change your social media. What's your social media look like? Does it look like worldly things on your phone? Put Christian accounts on your social media. Right? Change your TV. Change what you watch. If you're watching all these soap operas and, I don't know, action movies and all this stuff, you know, there's nothing wrong with watching a show, you know. Uh, I'm not, you know, being too hardcore saying you can't watch TV, you know. Some people get real hardcore with that. But I'm saying, man, if, if, if the content you're watching is not Christian, you know, if that's the majority of things you're letting pass through your mind, how do you think that's going to affect you? You're, you're watching the world system. It's going to affect you, right? Man, put that Christian show on. Seek the things of God. Put, let, be careful what you put in your eyes and your ears, right? How's your YouTube account? What do you watch on YouTube? You know, all these things, the practical changes uh, will have great effect because you're sowing into the spirit and there will be a reward. Amen. So ask and seek the things of God and he will give you more desire for him. The desire for God grows like a fire, right? The more you put into that fire, the greater that fire gets. It's the same thing with temptation. Temptation's like a fire as well. It's a burning fire. And the more you feed that fire of temptation, the more you're going to succumb to sin. But the fire of God, the fire of passion, the fire of zeal, the more you put into your relationship with God, the more you feed that fire with wood and with um, gasoline and, and different things or whatever you use to fuel your fire, right? You kindle that fire. It's going to grow. Kindle you the fire of God in your life and it will grow. It will grow so great and you will begin to love the world, not love the world. Um, Tina, I saw put a verse in the chat. I wanted to read it and we're going to come to a close now. Uh, but she put a, a verse in James in the chat and this is a really good verse. Uh, saying what I've been saying uh, as well. Uh, I actually can't seem to find it now. Oh, here it is. It says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Amen. Guys, do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The desires of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. Don't be tempted by them. Don't let them distract you. Because we're on a mission here. This life is a vapor. And... The kingdom of God is the most real thing. Don't grow weary. Ask God to fill you with more love for him. Look at what Jesus did for you on the cross. 
Jesus has set you apart. Jesus has called you to live holy. He says, live holy as I am holy. I've set you apart. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. So shine your light. Spread that love. Carry that joy. And watch God work. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come to you. We thank you for your love for us. Lord, root out, prune up, burn up every desire that's not from you. Sanctify us, purge us, cleanse us according to your word so that we might be a chaste virgin, a pure bride, a holy temple for your spirit to dwell. Thank you for your shed blood and the resurrection power that we have in Jesus. I pray a blessing upon your people. Amen.